Um, there was evidence that you were doing intensive research, but you might have also been in a red convertible at some stage, so I hope that's something I first learned of Natalia's work in about two, late 2000s in Sydney before she moved to Melbourne. Um, there she was making detailed paintings that studied fabrics and draped elements from Japanese QA or pillow books. Natalia still critically engages with the history of painting and makes strategic use of dense detail, attractive patterning and domestic design elements, elements often to smuggle difficult content into her work. So these works that we're seeing here are called Woman 1 and Woman 5. Can you start with the title of the works? Okay, um, and can I just, uh, I am unusually inarticulate today, um, and so please ask me questions because I have a sneaking su suspicion that my focus will um, go so far. <laughs> Do you want to take a seat? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the titles are... Um, indicative of the series of works that it's based on. So the paintings are based on Decrini's Woman series and famously he um, titled them Woman 1, Woman 2, Woman 3, Woman 4, Woman 5, uh, Woman with Bicycle, Two Women in the Country, never actual names. Um, and when he spoke about them, he, um, I mean, he was, <laughs> by the end of his career, pretty hostile um, to, to questions around which women they might be in reference to. Um, in some of the writings, he talks about them as um, it, because of them being a female form, and it might be positioned in this way or that way. So, um, yeah, I wanted to retain that aspect of the work because that's my target. <laughs> that um, is slightly dehumanising aspect of the work. Thank you. Um, I also want to say that um, in preparing for this exhibition, conversations with Natalia have been hugely valuable, as they were with Angela and my colleagues here. Uh, and Natalia's PhD looked to kind of beauty and the repellent, and it was really fantastic to speak with her about it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the way she handled beauty and the grotesque? Um, okay. <laughs> Um, so the PhD title was The Grotesque, the Decorative and the Explicit in the work of Carl Walker and Aubrey Beardsley in particular. Um, and I, the reading that I did around the grotesque was about how in uh, everyday experience today we usually use it to denote an experience that's akin to horror or discomfort, but that its etymological origins tie it actually to a decorative tradition. It was used originally to name these forms that were on the grotto um, of Nero's palace, so the sunken um, version of the palace that was discovered. Um, and the lots of the interesting reading that I found was about it straddling two um, incongruous positions, whatever they may be. Um, so beauty and horror side by side might be one way that the grotesque could be understood. Um, I think um, that um, contradictory kind of way of representing things is what I've been interested in across various bodies of work. Um, these ones are very different to the ones I started with, but I think that logic of trying to um, make um, visually seductive and compelling a form that is um, difficult, especially a, a form that's difficult because it's a version of the body that's hard to some of your, all, uh, all of your women some and some of mine. mine. And I want you to talk about that possessive mine and yours. Can you just unpack that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so all of your women and some of mine, um, it was one of those great ideas that came to me at, I don't know, 3 a.m. Um, because it was sort of part of this same body of work. I had started with Picasso and um, Manet's Olympia. So Demoiselle uh, de Avignon, <laughs> Picasso in particular, um, and the kind of early modern canon that um, used uh, women's bodies as a mode of experimentation or the kind of site of experimentation. And the term that's frequently invoked and it's still
still use today, um, much to my frustration, is the female form, um, which drives me nuts because it's like, I don't know, it gives license to some kind of obstruction um, of women's bodies that seem to me like part of the same impulse, some of the same dehumanising impulse that leads us to do all kinds of things to women, some of which Carla was talking about. I know that seems like a huge stress, a stretch, but um, it's like, it's okay to dismember, pull apart, um, utterly um, demolish a woman's body in that kind of moment of modernism for the sake of experimentation at the expense of any given woman. So um, all of your women was about the canon and some of mine was my response. Um, and yeah, because I'm trying to re-articulate it with the language of my very own and one that's close, more closely tied to the feminine as far as it's got these kind of domestic decorative associations, that's, um, that's the possessive in the instance of me. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to talk about a recent installation you did at UTS, which was looking at a neglected space in architecture, and you had to contend with some issues of safety and a field of uh, creating space of immersion, which we really get a sense of textures and uh, strict composition in your work. And I wanted to, and I think it's not the first time you've looked at environments or total immersion in your work. I just thought maybe you could talk about some of the architectural concerns and the challenges you faced with that and, and what your decisions were. Um, okay. Um, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I'm trying to transfer my website from one place to another place. And one thing that strikes me is that there are quite distinct bodies of work that wouldn't necessarily be recognisable as one person's unless you thought about it fairly laterally. And so these don't look like that UTS installation in any way, but it's motivated by a very similar concern. So um, the actual remit of the project was that I was asked, well, I was just given freedom to do anything in the UTS library as part of the residency project. And I was particularly interested in um, one space in the library where students sleep under the stairs. And it's it was gross. Um, it was um, makeshift. They dragged um, bean bags and cushions from other parts of the library under there, and what seemed particularly distinctive about it was that they were mostly, like very rarely female students, mostly male students. And um, so I was interested in um, what it was about that space that wasn't safe for female students to rest, because I remember my experience as sort of study being in sleep, <laughs> you know, like studying is sleepy business. Um, and I wanted to do something about that. It was also uh, the, the university was uh, confronted with some really damning statistics about, um, so they were doing a consent matters um, project across the university. Um, and so I decided that everything I did in that space was, would be about trying to recognize that it was a space for sleeping but um, open the potential for um, a new demographic to feel safe in sleeping there. So I made fabric and wallpaper and redesigned um, the space. I'm particularly interested in the ways that the decorative is perceived to be marginal, but it has this uh, remarkable power actually to say things and do things that we don't expect of it. And the great news is that the space has changed, the use of it has changed radically. I keep getting sent really great photos of um, young women sleeping in there. Um, and yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalia. And we'll be able to see um, Natalia with an open studio at the end of the year at the Police and Art Gallery. So. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you.